Hi, I've just seen across the screen that we've gone live. So um, I'd like to welcome you to the Transatlantic Slavery Symposium. Um, I'm sure some of you have already been listening to some of the really interesting sessions that have taken place yesterday, today and tomorrow. So uh, the session, I was gonna say this evening because it's 7 p.m. where I am. Um, I know it's uh, we've got people from England joining uh, and across the US, so it's lunchtime and the afternoon. Um, but so our, our session, is entitled Historic Sites Interpreting Slavery. Um, and I think it's gonna be a really, really interesting um, and relevant um, uh, session and, and very much um, in the news, um, a lot of uh, contemporary issues um, that we can think about, um, especially uh, during the last couple of years. Um, so I'm gonna just give a, a little bit of information so you know where you're heading with this session. Um, I'll introduce myself, I'm Dr. Laura Sandy. I'm a senior lecturer um, in the history of slavery. I specialize in American slavery. Um, at the University of Liverpool. Um, and I'm also the co-director of the Center for the Study of International Slavery, which is a collaborative research center across the University of Liverpool in the UK um, and the International Slavery Museum um, in Liverpool in the UK. So I'm gonna be joined uh, on our panel this evening shortly um, by uh, Ramin Gainstrom, uh, who's the executive director of Westport Museum for History and Culture in Connecticut. Um, and Dr. Antoinette uh, T. Jackson, um, who's professor and chair of her Department of Anthropology at the University of South Florida, um, and Jean-Francois uh, Manicom, um, who works in the UK um, at uh, the International Slavery Museum um, in the city where I work. Uh, so I'm gonna introduce them a little bit later and they'll introduce themselves. Um, so I'm just gonna tell you a couple of things um, about the symposium um, and the sessions. Um, and then I'm gonna move on and give you a, a short introduction um, to what we'll be talking about, give you some context um, to think about um, for our discussion today. Um, and of course, um, at the end uh, or towards the end of our session, we would really love it if you would uh, send us some questions um, to think about, give us your, your thoughts, your ideas, um, and ask us anything you like really. Um, so we'd be happy to hear from you. So a few things of note that this symposium, um, if you've joined us already, um, is a fantastic joint effort between the Roger, uh, Robert H. Smith Scholarship Center at the Benjamin Franklin House um, of London, uh, the Fred W. Smith National Library for the study of George Washington at Mount Vernon, and the Robert H. Smith International Center for Jeffersonian Studies at Monticello. Um, I should actually be at Vernon right now um, doing a fellowship, but unfortunately COVID has prevailed. But I'm really, really happy to be part of this event um, and taking part in some ways. Hopefully um, I'll be in the US soon. So I just wanna remind the audience, or if you're new to this uh, this evening, um, that there are six sessions in total as part of this symposium, and they're being broadcast, I'm sure you're on, on one of these different platforms across YouTube, Facebook, um, and Twitter channels. So, so we're getting out and about, um, and they'll be available for you to uh, replay um, anytime you would like. They're being recorded. Um, uh, as the session takes place, they'll be available as soon as each session is over. So if you do miss anything, you need to leave, you want to share them with someone else, please do go ahead. Um, they're there free and available for you to um, access. Um, so as I said, um, we'd love you to participate uh, later on in the session, uh, anything that springs to mind. So if you would like to join our conversation um, uh, uh, today, then you need to put your questions in the comments section um, of the social media channel um, that you're using. Um, and then those questions will be fielded to me and I will ask as many as possible. Um, and hopefully we'll be able to answer your questions uh, um, and get you involved in the conversation. Um, so our panel today, um, as I said, is about the challenges um, and opportunities, um, I think that lay ahead um, of interpreting slavery at historic sites. A lot of work's been done in the past, um, but especially at this point in time, there's a lot to do. And I think there's a, a lot of development ahead and a lot of transformation um, that we, um, uh, as people involved um, in heritage, in academia, uh, anyone in the public um, and beyond in different organizations should be taking part in. So I'm gonna give this sort of short introduction. You're welcome to ask me questions later too. Um, although um, do, do um, uh, uh, engage with our panelists because they're here um, with much more specialism than I am, I'm, I'm sure. So I've spent a lot of time um, at various heritage sites and museums in the US during my research visits, during my career in the last 10 to 15 years. And personally being from the UK, I've been really impressed 
with a lot of the exhibits and work that's being carried out around the challenging heritage of slavery and what's being done um, at various heritage sites like Monticello, like Mount Vernon, um, Montpellier. I spend quite a bit of time, as you can probably guess, in Virginia, but in many other places across the US, of course, the fantastic um, uh, museum uh, in Washington too for African-American history and culture. Um, and I think uh, lots of the sites, the heritage sites in the US um, and the museums that uh, are across the country are making a serious, uh, serious effort um, and attempt to address the sensitive histories of slavery um, and how they're told and presented. And, and you can um, put forward your opinions on uh, things, of course, um, that you think about this, sites you visited, things that you think that should be improved or could be added. And we'd really love to hear that. So projects like the Getting Word Project at Monticello, um, an oral history project, um, looking at descendants of the enslaved, uh, which you can access online for free. You can go to the Monticello website, but many others uh, like these um, in the US are really trying hard uh, to engage and include the communities and stakeholders whose histories um, are being told. However, I think everyone on the panel would agree, uh, and I, I certainly think this, there's a, a long way to go and a lot of challenges and hopefully a lot of solutions, some we'll talk about today, um, uh, ahead of us. So drawing on my own experiences in the UK as the director for the Center for the Study of International Slavery um, in collaboration with the International Slavery Museum, I've seen how quickly the landscape and debates can change. The museum and the center were created and opened in 2007, which was uh, the moment when the UK commemorated the 200 year anniversary of the 1807 act by British Parliament to abolish the transatlantic slave trade. Now that wasn't abolishing slavery um, itself, that continued disappointingly. Um, so at the time in 2007, the museum in Liverpool um, was the first of its kind in the world. Um, it was groundbreaking and innovative and did a brilliant job. They have an amazing staff um, uh, and we are really, really lucky to, to have uh, one of the um, staff here today, Jean-Francois, who will talk to you later. Um, however, even as I go to the museum, and I think other people could agree, um, and we can see um, across the globe as uh, different people try to grapple with the histories of slavery and colonization and empire and contemporary slavery, that the debate and the public expectations um, and demand has changed dramatically. Um, as to what people would like to see. And again, I would urge you to tell us uh, what you feel about that. So the museum in Liverpool, opened in 2007, has now been surpassed in some ways um, and uh, by changes that have taken place in the heritage sector, changes in political climate, um, and changes in educational needs. Um, many, many other things have happened, of course, we know that. So the museum in Liverpool itself needs to be updated. Um, and we, we need people's feedback for that. We need people to, uh, to contribute um, and talk about um, what they think is important when they visit a historic site, um, thinking about slavery or a museum or an exhibit. Um, the museum in Liverpool has been taking the redevelopment very seriously uh, and, uh, in the last 15 years. Um, and I'm happy to announce just a couple of weeks ago um, that in Liverpool there's been great success um, and uh, a large funding bid has been won um, for its redevelopment. So this is great news. Um, however, I think the challenge for all of us, whether in the US, the UK or globally, um, is to open the conversation, and I hope we'll do that today, to talk to each other um, and think about addressing some of the really present important issues that I hope our panelists um, will, will talk about and our audience uh, will ask us questions. So I'm not gonna talk too much because uh, uh, we, we wanna move on to the panel, um, but I'd like to uh, kind of welcome our panel um, from me, um, and I'd like to kind of uh, move forward now um, and introduce our panel to you um, so we can get into some of the debate. So first up, um, who's gonna join me is, is Ramin uh, Gainstrom, as I said, the executive director of Westport Museum for History and Culture um, in Connecticut. Um, uh, I had a quick, as I said earlier, Google around, um, as everyone does these days. So uh, uh, you started as a journalist at Columbia University. Um, you spent a career researching and writing about culture and history. I heard a lot about food before we got on here, so I'm very excited about the history of food. You've written seven books and you're a professionally trained chef. What's not to like here? So <laughs> do you tell us from your vast experience of all sorts of um, travel and research into history, um, and business and the heritage sector, a little bit about yourself, Ramin. 
Uh, so as you said, that's that's correct. I'm a journalist by training, <clears throat> and I came to public history very organically because I I was um, I was a I am I'm a chef, and I tended to write about history organically through food. Um, and I became very interested 11 years ago in um, Hercules, the enslaved chef of George Washington, um, and spent 11 years researching him and writing a book about him. And that was really my entree to deeply focusing on slavery in a, in a formal context, um, outside of a cultural context, which is that I am a person partially of Caribbean descent from Trinidad and Tobago. So it's always part of my um, sort of um, social milieu, but really to think about it very formally, um, it was really when I started this work about Hercules Posey and that led me to becoming a history museum, a public historian and history museum director. Brilliant. Thanks for that. And uh, yeah, I mean, again, I'd encourage anyone to research around uh, Hercules and, 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 and a own a judge as well. They're very yes. interesting stories. So, and again, very useful to, to talk about them when people visit Monticello um, uh, and when people visit Mount Vernon. So great. Um, um, do you have anything else you'd like to add or shall I move on so that we, yeah? Yeah, let's, uh, you know, I can talk about what we do a bit, but if you want to introduce everybody first, it's whatever you, you want. Um, Brilliant, I'll do that and then I'm going to ask you guys about your different experiences. So we'll, we'll move on to that together. Thanks very much. So next uh, next up is Dr. Antoinette Jackson. Um, as I said, is the Professor uh, and Chair of the Department of Anthropology at the University of South Florida. Um, and she's published many works. Um, in this area, and I've got a few questions specifically about her books that are fantastic. Um, the, the two stand out, of course, Heritage, Tourism and Race, The Other Side of Leisure, published last year, 2020, um, and Speaking for the Enslaved, Heritage, Interpretation and Antebellum Plantation Sites in 2012. I think I got that right. <laughs> <laughs> Hello? Hello? Yeah, so do tell us about yourself. Oh, yes. Uh, as you said in the formal introduction, I am a, a professionally trained anthropologist. And what I bring, uh, my interest is cultural anthropology. And what uh, one of the various interests I have is living communities and peoples and their relationship to these uh, plantation spaces. I came into this work, uh, interestingly enough, in, in, as an avoidance. Uh, I was a, uh, I had an MBA and I worked for uh, Lucent Technologies and AT&T uh, when they were one uh, at the split. And I had worked uh, doing these kinds of stories as a hobby. And then one day I took a trip along the Southeast coast of the US and the Sea Islands uh, near the Charleston area, Buford, St. Helena's Island. And I, I had always avoided plantation spaces. And because the history was something I, I, I figured I knew about and it seemed very depressing and, and, and um, something I didn't need to dwell on. Uh, but when I went to Charleston and went to Beaufort and St. Helens Island, I learned about the Gullah Geechee community and the enslaved Africans who were experts at rice technology and growing rice and, and learning from about uh, slavery and enslavement in those plantation communities from that perspective got me off my journey for, as a business professional and into the cultural anthropology apology uh, train, and that's a, uh, a very short rendition, but I, I was so moved and, and realized that I had a story to tell, and there was a story to tell about these plantation spaces that were completely missing from the dialogue. And so uh, that is my initiative, is to tell untold stories of plantation spaces and communities and enslaved Africans who are descendants of people who worked on these plantations, because the, the story is not comprehensive and what we know is incomplete. And so my research is centered on bringing descendant knowledges to the forefront, talking to descendants, learning about plantation spaces from that perspective, and also looking at it from the present back back into the past. So how do we connect what we know about people and places and people's connections to those places places today uh, and connect to the past? So that way we have more of a living uh, community uh, con conversation around these spaces. And that's that's part of the charter, I think, with uh, the challenge, what, what where we are today is how we bring in living community, descendant knowledges into these conversations about plantation spaces. And both of my books basically really hone in on that. And I've done work on plantations in the Southeast from Kingsley Plantation in Florida to Friendfield Plantation where um, uh, Michelle Obama uh, 
uh, was a descendant or her relatives were descendants of. So really a wide range of uh, actual research in telling some of these untold stories about African communities in plantation spaces. So looking forward to this dialogue. Thanks very much. And, and I can certainly say that thanks to your work, I, I have benefited and so have my students and many others. So I'm really glad that you got pulled off track and, and <laughs> <laughs> path. Um, <laughs> open things up so amazing work and I can't wait to hear more from you about it thanks for your introduction um so last but not least from, from the city I work in I think I'm a bit overexcited about seeing someone from Liverpool on the screen now um it's Jean-Francois Manacom um and uh, as I said earlier he's the lead curator um of transatlantic slavery and legacies at the International Slavery Museum Liverpool he previously worked I'm sure we'll talk about this um, at the Memorial ACTE in Guadeloupe in the French West Indies, um, the first memorial site dedicated to the history of slavery. And last year I saw that you uh, won uh, the order, uh, or were awarded the Order of Arts and Letters, um, the Order of France from the French Minister of Culture, which is an amazing award um, that recognizes your significant contributions to the arts, literature, culture, um, and the impacts that you've made um, in this sector, which have obviously been very, very significant. So, so please do tell us a bit about yourself. Thank you, Dr. Sandy. Um, thank you for, the, for your introduction. Yes, I'm Jean-François Manicom coming from the French Caribbean. I'm coming myself from Guadeloupe. So um, I really born and grew up in the plantation. And uh, so I have the perspective about slavery from a guy from the plantation and at the same time i have i have the chance to work now in in liverpool so i have the the european perspective on 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 slavery also uh, i'm coming myself from the field of the contemporary art uh, in the first life i was an artist myself and um, it's uh, probably one of the reasons why i think that one of the one of the best or one of the stronger key to to understand slavery and to make this uh, type of painful story understand understandable by the audience is is the contemporary art and um, for my opinion it's really really something that we have to 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 show up a little bit more so uh, and when i say contemporary art i mean uh, i thinking about uh, performance theater novel um, uh, video art uh, and so and so every type of of um, of contemporary art it's a big help uh, for us in order to 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 make the community make the audience understand a little bit more or feel a little bit more because we're not speaking about only knowledge only academic research uh, so i think that we have to mix the medias uh, actually in order to have a bigger impact in in the audience Thank you. Thank you, Jean-Francois. I couldn't agree with you more. And, uh, you know, I think Liverpool are thoroughly lucky to have you in the, in the city um, doing the work that you're doing. So and I can't wait to hear more about that. And I, yeah, we can we can talk about the arts and how this can and should definitely be incorporated to, to, to bring more to people in different ways um, and in a more meaningful way um, in some some perspectives. So what I'm going to do now is I think that everyone's going to join um, together. Um, I'm going to throw out a few questions um, to the panel um, and, and they're going to sort of chat around uh, these. Um, I've got a few specific things. Um, and again, panelists, please do talk at will or bring anything that you would like to um, into the discussion. And then we'll move on uh, towards the end um, to our audience part of the conversation. So. I, I, I obviously work in this field. I am I'm a lecturer. I do work at universities. So in some ways, uh, I find myself um, not as useful as I might be sometimes. And I, I wish I was doing more um, uh, in other areas. So to take part um, in debates um, and conversations about what should and could be done um, more broadly in the arts, in heritage, um, and, and globally um, is really, really important. So I'm going to start by asking you a really sort of general question to lead on from what you introduced about yourself is can you tell the audience um, and just raise your hand or just anyone um, about the various experiences you've had um, of how you've seen slavery presented at various heritage sites 
um, during your career uh, in different locations and what parts you've played um, in either transforming that um, or challenging perhaps um, certain things that you disagree with or, or things that you think are good but need work on. Can you take, give us some examples of uh, a, a bit more uh, of, of what you've been doing in your careers um, in this subject area? I'll, I'll go. Um, <clears throat> so at, at Westport Museum, <clears throat> I should say just as by way of a little bit of background, Westport, Connecticut is 45 minutes outside of Manhattan, roughly. Um, it is a very affluent coastal town in Connecticut. Um, and Connecticut is a very democratic, largely liberal, progressive state. And this is an extremely progressive town, or at least so it thinks about itself in that way. Um, and that makes it, has made it very difficult because it's not simply a denial of the legacy of slavery. There's a denial that it even existed here. And so when we did here, we did an exhibit called, I curated an exhibit called Remember the History of African Americans in Westport. And essentially um, it was building from scratch. We first had to convince people that slavery did in fact exist um, in Connecticut, it existed in Westport. It was the economic engine of the town. Um, so uh, this this exhibit, in fact, incorporated a lot of the things that we are talking about. It in included performance. It included rebuilt spaces to have um, interactivity. It had it culminated with an installation of a brick walk of the names of the enslaved that essentially functions in a way like an art ex exhibition, an outdoor art exhibition would, would function. Um, so that's what we've done here. And, and I can certainly talk more about it um, but later. But at large, what we have found and what I have found um, that I respond to um, at different heritage sites is that when um, slavery, slavery and its legacy uh, and the, and the human stories of the enslaved are completely incorporated into history, not as a drop in, right? This is the argument that we have in the education system in the United States, you know, that you kind of push in these segments. Um, people wrongly call it critical race theory. This is the argument that's going on right now in America versus a holistic discussion of it as um, essentially the engine of the United States, right? So to me, that, that's where I feel the best heritage site work is being done. Very recently, I have to say that I went, I was just in Virginia. I was at Mount Vernon, I was at Monticello, and I was at Strat, uh, Stratford Hall, the home of the Lee family, uh, the birthplace of Robert E. Lee of the, the Confederacy. And I, I wanna say that I think that Stratford Hall is doing the best work under the, the guidance of Dr. Kelly Fanto Dietz, where what they did, was they completely reorganized their basic, here's the history of Stratford Hall, to have a totally intertwined history of the enslaved and the enslaver through the eras side by side, because of course that life was inextricably intertwined. You know, it wasn't, here's all the Lees, and over here, here's a little bit about slavery, sort of, you know, um, it, un downplayed. So they completely redid it where let's look at life on a daily basis and let's look at how completely and totally tied together inter, you know, you know, dependent this life was. Um, and to me, that's the best work that I've really seen. And that's where I think the best work can be done. Yeah. Thanks a lot. Yeah. yeah, and pick, picking up on that, I, I totally agree that as I started doing my research, my ish, my concern was the same, that this is not an isolated history. This is totally integral to American history. And, and I think that's the problem with uh, the way people have generally approached it is that it's been segmented off uh, and segregated off into its own conversation. And so as I started doing my work, I started looking at particularly at Kingsley Plantation, which is, has a similar story of the George Washington kind of issue where the plantation owner uh, had one of his mistresses uh, was a, a black woman. And uh, the narrative prior to some of my work was that, you know, this was a romance made in heaven and it was no complications that although she was enslaved um, and he married her at that point or, or she was his mistress that, you know, all was well. 
Um, but part of my work was to challenge that and look at that in more complexity. She definitely uh, was a one of his many mistresses. So I put the story in context to that uh, in terms of my research, but mostly looking at it from the present. Um, people who were descendants of not only the plantation, only Zephaniah Kingsley, but the descendants of uh, Anna Kingsley, who was one of his mistresses, and finding those descendants in the present, and then going back and talking about that story and their relationship to the plantation and to that history, uh, and connecting that to the plantation, the place, the current, uh, when they have the family reunions and those kinds of things, have that conversation uh, through the descendants, through both descendants of uh, Anna Kingsley was also a slave owner herself, so it's also complicating that part of the narrative. So seeing the the range of the story uh, from the, the people that were enslaved on the plantation and people who were owners of the plantation in the present, and how do those descendants talk about their relationship to the past and how they either avoid it or have come to understand it in more uh, complex ways, and how they that challenges others to come into the story because they can see it from so many uh, different angles and conversations. And so bringing, again, bringing those kinds of uh, current um, issues into the present. And one of the things I also did was look at the plantation, not as an isolated space, but as a community, a plantation community, which includes all the people who were connected to that plantation in some way or the other, whether enslaved, slave owners, worked on the plantation, had some other types of association. So linking all kinds of narratives to that space in the present and going backwards was one of the kind of interesting things looking at it as a plantation community in, in, in Jacksonville, Florida. So I was able to connect uh, the living communities all around Jacksonville to the to the plantation and gain interest in that because I can show almost everything within one degree of separation within Jacksonville was related can be related to the Kingsley plantation space. So bringing all those stories in context to the plantation, not as one isolated space, but integral to the entire Jacksonville and beyond and through the descendants and through uh, the actual material culture uh, in Jacksonville. So it was a, it was quite a, a looking at it, Kingsley Plantation as a, a community versus a plantation space is one of the contributions. Great. Yeah, no, I, and again, um, it just struck me that while you two were talking, um, this sort of entwined history, looking, you know, looking beyond that, looking at the, the current community's descendant history, I, I often think it's strange when I'm going in the UK or the US, uh, but in the, I, I guess I do more in the US in terms of going uh, to slavery heritage sites and obviously part of that is uh, i'm sure francois can talk to this i could too about some of the problems in the, in the uk um, and various things that we can come on to uh, with various heritage organizations but i always think it's a bit odd when you can go and choose to do your tour and there's a slavery tour and you think well slavery is it actually so why is there a slavery tour and i did get once told i couldn't go on the slavery tour because it was too hot and i just stood there and i thought well it was really hot when people had to be enslaved and work in the field so, <laughs> you know um but I, I completely agree. I mean, I, I don't understand. To move forward, it has to be entwined. It has to be integral. And we have to have those other marginalized stories as well that you talked about. Um, do you want to add anything, Jean-Francois? I have a... Yeah, I will, I will just uh, tell you the story of when I was 12. <laughs> I was a very young guy coming from a very mixed races family with uh, white blood, uh, enslaved uh, people blood, and uh, Indian blood from the south of India. And uh, with a very activist family who was fighting for, for the memory of the enslaved. So coming from this uh, family, I was very, very fascinated and interested in my ancestor and the story of the enslaved. And when I was 12, um my my professor say okay we're going as a, a class all the class we're going to visit the shell share museum uh, Mus shell share was a, a big abolitionist french abolitionist and uh, it was the only venue that they were speaking about slavery because of personality of shell share in guadeloupe so i'm living in guadeloupe i'm 12 years old so it's probably 40 years, more than 40 years ago. 
And uh, as everybody know, when you're living in Caribbean, everything is is based around the slavery. Slavery is always somewhere in the social story, kitchen story, love story, uh, social history, music history. Um, everything, everything is in Guadeloupe is born from from the plantation and from the story and slavery. So the impact of the slavery <laughs> in Caribbean and in Guadeloupe, it's 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 just the life. It's just the real life. So arriving in uh, in uh, in this museum, Museum Shellshare, at this time, so Shellshare was a, a kind of a guy from the French elite. So he built his own connection collection of things he was interested in: uh, pottery, uh, sculpture from Greece. Uh, uh, <coughs> science, day, and uh, some curiosity coming from Europe. And when he died, he gives his collection to the Guadeloupe department in order to educate the black people about the European, the European culture. And this is the museum. It was the, the museum that he was speaking about. So in this museum, speaking about slavery, the collection, the permanent collection, was artifact copies of the classic Greek and uh, 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 European collection, and nobody was speaking about about my own ancestor. So, from my perspective of a young guy, this visit killed a second time my own ancestor. It was, it was incredible for me that they not there is no no things that they were speaking about them, and. It was the only place to do. So this created a real trauma for, to me to say that in my country there is no venue that they are speaking about them. And I think that is probably the starting point of my career, honestly. <laughs> Thank you so much for that. And I'm going to come on to that question of, of challenges and trauma next. Um, I, as a slight sort of um, addition to that, I was going to say where uh, in particular, but I uh, I went to the Caribbean um, to do some work and I, I went to a, a plantation to, to to do a bit of research and to go around. And the house was filled with um, cameras, glasses, spectacles um, and different things that the one of the owners had collected and um, some a lot of portraits. And it was so strange <laughs> that that slavery wasn't really mentioned and you were in the middle of it. So, well, I'll come on to the, the then perhaps a related question for all of you. It's a two-parter. I hate I hate people who give me two-parter questions. It means I have to listen very carefully, but I'm going to do it anyway. So the first part is, what, what's the biggest challenge that you have faced really in your career? or what, And what do you think are the challenges that we collectively face um, in trying to, um, you know, move things forward and then also it, uh, sort of pertaining to Jean-Francois's point about trauma um could you if, you if you're happy to tell us a little about your experiences of the trauma or toll um of working with these stories of slavery um on a day-to-day -day basis um and what kind of psychological uh, uh protection do you think is needed or what kind of support is needed um, for those people working in these careers um, and, and working with traumatic stories every day. So should I go? Yeah, go for it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah uh, yes. Um, I think that uh, because it's a question in two parts, uh, the more the more tricky things that I have to deal in my everyday works and the more difficult for my for my position, the, the, the really the tricky thing, it's working in a museum institute organization because uh, in the in the common sense of people uh, in in UK in in the psyche in the uh, in the in the idea of global people of the audience, when you're walking in a museum or when you're visiting a museum, you're going to have information about an old story. So you're supposed to see uh, dinosaurus bones or Saxon sword or um, German uh, boats, very very old stuff. And it's it's tricky for me to to transform this this uh, old old vision 
of what is a museum because honestly in this in this case of slavery we're speaking about a live story we're not speaking about an old story based in the past slavery is not based in the past and it's not because it's finished in the trade finished in uh, 1807 in in uk that the story of of the slavery stop in 1807. So it's a very contemporary story, very actual story. And, and, and in UK, it's it's something, the, 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 the power of slavery on the actual, uh, on the actual um, society of UK, it's a massive, I have plenty of example of contemporary things that arrived now that directly link with with slavery so for me the the main problem it's because it's a museum they're waiting something old and i have to make it live mm. and the second thing i think that it's because we are very few museums speaking about traumatic story and we can share this experience with the jewish uh, story in in, uh, in uh, and all the war story so because we are not a lot uh, uh, around the we are only one slavery museum in all europe i think that it's time to share between us between professional of that to share what is the the main the main uh, solution to protect our own staff because honestly honestly the waste of this story is on our shoulder so it's okay the probably the four first years, you have big shoulder to handle this type of, of problematic. But when the years growing up, sometimes you starting to have doubts uh, about legitimation. Did I have, I have what is my legitimacy? Is it, is it because I make a PhD that give me the, the power to speak about slavery that way or that way? It's, it's created a lot, a lot of pressure on our shoulder and our, our the shoulder of our staff. And I think that it's time to face that honestly and to say, okay, probably my staff or myself will need uh, help where this, this help can come. And uh, I think that the debate must be open about that, honestly. For, you know, for me, um, I work with living people again in communities and I do a lot of interviews and I try to understand a story from descendants, uh, the descendant knowledge perspective, meaning people who are directly descended from enslaved Africans or descended from their relationship to plantation communities, how to understand these stories. But invariably I, I run into roadblocks because because many people don't want to talk about that, those kinds of stories or those kinds of connections, either because they are ashamed or because uh, they don't, they feel guilty if they're on the other side where they were descendants of people who enslaved others. Uh, so uh, I had to figure out ways to ask questions uh, to get people engaged in these kinds of conversations. So it is depending on which, uh, plantation I'm working with or which plantation community I'm working with, I have to figure out ways of entry. And one thing, uh, I work with a lot of, uh, with a lot of rice plantation uh, museums and sites. Um, particularly, I worked at Jahasi Island Rice Plantation in uh, South Carolina and uh, the Charles Pinckney uh, National Park site. And to get people who are descendants and connected to that plantation uh, engaged in some of the discussions I wanted, I, I talked about recipes and cooking and I think some, we were talking about food earlier. And one way people are able to bridge that conversation is I said, tell me about how you learned to make rice or how, do, how did you learn to do a particular recipe? And they would take me back into those connections. Like I learned it from my grandmother, my great grandmother, and she was, you know, worked on XYZ plantation. And so I get into the story that way and people were more open to discussing it or on a different topic, not directly tell me about slavery. Like people don't wanna just come directly into that kind of conversation. So I had to learn that. <laughs> I had to learn those kinds of ways to enter conversations with people. And the other thing from my perspective uh, is how do you deal with your own personal uh, anger and trauma and uh, in thinking about what happened in the past. And again, it was working with people who were descendants or who had direct connections and knew their direct connections to some of this plantation history that I actually, you know, overcame or 
came away with a growth of myself. One, one person, Miss Maddie Gilliard, I, uh, I credit Miss Maddie Gilliard, a descendant of uh, the Pink the Charles Pinkney uh, National Park site uh, plantation, for helping me to see the plantation in a broader, more comprehensive perspective. Because when I interviewed her, and she took me to the plantation where she had. Uh, she even herself had lived and worked. She was in her 80s when I interviewed her, and she had lived and worked in one of the and lived in one of the little plantation or the little um, enslaved uh, African uh, houses on the, uh, the the plantation. And she was very upset when she saw that it, they were doing renovations and they tore the roof off her house. And she was like, "Oh, my house! The roof is off!" And she was really distraught. And I was thinking, "Who cares about some you know slave enslaved hut or you know?" facility like that. I was like angry that it was even there. And she started talking about like all the things, you know, the, the relationships she had in there, her parents, her grandmother, the cooking, all kinds of other stories. And it just opened me up to thinking about that uh, space is not only trauma and all of the things we associated with, uh, but also it was home. It was all, all types of other connections that she had. And so I started looking at the sites in different ways and it kind of opened me up to thinking about the a compre more comprehensive understanding of the plantation. And I credit that again to all the people who I've uh, interviewed that I learned these kinds of things. And I, again, not that the trauma is not there, but that's not the only thing that was going on. And people you know, had all kinds of expertise and skills and things that they brought to that those spaces that are get overlooked. They're not marginalized. They're actually the center of the story. <laughs> they should be. So, um, so those are the kinds of things that, you know, I've learned and I was taught as uh, working in this kind of area around trauma and, and the challenges thereof. Um, so you've, you've both said so much that I agree with a thousand percent. I mean, the, 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 so, you know, Antoinette, the impetus of my work has been around food. That is really, you know, I'm really a culinary historian. And um, exactly what you say is true. So what I have found is that, uh, for example, while I can talk to people about Hercules Posey, research that I did with a colleague, actually determined his last name recently, um, the enslaved chef of Washington, because he was this, you know, remarkable chef, right, that he was a, a skilled um, culinary artist, people want to hear about that. Yeah. because we live in that kind of culture and because i can talk about him in that way i can back into the thing that people <laughs> don't want to hear about right, exactly. which is george washington and <laughs> other human yes. beings and went to great lengths to keep them that way right exactly um, so i agree with you a hundred percent and i have to say that um you know jean francois you and i we share the same cultural heritage um almost exactly and um it, so what i see in the in as a difficulty in this heritage that we share in the Caribbean and actually here in the American North is that um, there, because slavery, the trade ended so much earlier in the Caribbean um, and because uh, it ended earlier than the American South in the American North, there has been this ability to, to bury hmm. it right because it is traumatic to talk about it you know so in my although i was born and raised in the united states you know i was always in trinidad this was not a discussed thing you know and laura to your point you know when i was recently in virginia it was a very hot day and my daughter was complaining about the heat and we were at stratford hall and i looked at her and i said i said imagine if you were like your ancestors cutlassing macheteing cane in this kind of heat every single day, you know? And then I realized after that's my trauma coming out, you know? I didn't have to really go there, right? But it's that trauma that comes out. Um, and so that is a challenge that when you're dealing in populations where there has been um, a longer period of time in which to bury it and not talk about it because there's shame. I mean, to this day in Trinidad and Tobago, there's a reluctance to engage in agriculture because of what agriculture means to us, right? What it's really about. Um, so, you know, to me, that's the difficulty. But what, what you said, um, uh, Jean-Francois, about the collective of institutions working together to share the experience is where I think um, the trauma can be addressed. And I think more broadly, the, um, I think that as institutions, we have to agree 
that we're talking about an integral story. Frankly, in the United States, even if you're a modern art museum, if you're any kind of museum in the United States, you're, ta you're, you're talking about a cultural experience built on the engine of slavery and racial oppression. And if these are just integrated into every aspect of what we do, what we have is a collective and foundational support system um, where it becomes um, less able to onslaught um, the institution and the individuals. And I will say you have to have broad shoulders. You know, we've taken a position of being activist historians. We present the history, but we no longer take um, and this is difficult for me at first because I am a journalist by training. We, we used to present it. Here's a fact, here's a fact, here's a fact, here's a fact. Well, we've learned that you can't expect that people are necessarily going to walk away and understand what those facts really mean, not just at that period of time, but into the present. So we have taken a more activist position where we tell them, let me, let me be clear what this means, right? You live in this beautiful town where there's 2% African-Americans, 4% people of color, let me tell you why. I'm not leaving it up to your, uh, you know, ascertaining the facts we've provided. So I think that's another way to kind of um, inadvertently protect yourself from trauma. Because if everybody's doing the same work and everybody's on the same page, or at least agreeing to try to get there, it's easier, united front um, is e easier to withstand the onslaught. Definitely. And um, uh, there's an interesting, and again, you may have seen this in the news or not, but and it, it addresses all of the issues that you've discussed of, of this guilt and shame and confronting that. And then there's the idea that, well, actually, this might be a leisure activity I do on my holiday. And why would I want to go on guilty? <laughs> but at the same right. time, I do want to be educated. How do we, and how do we get people into that and, and actually confronting someone else's trauma, their own trauma. Again, the, the idea of the all the different stories coming together, getting community history, but well, it's beyond that, that's not even, um, doesn't really cut it as a, a way of explaining it, but how do we get people interested? Um, you know, and actually, you know, I think you're hundred percent right. You have to be an activist uh, about this. You have to go, right, well, I'm gonna push harder, but I'm gonna find ways in so that people do still turn up. They do want to learn, they do want to come and they want to go that bit further. And I, uh, what I was gonna say before we go on to our audience questions is, and I think it was last November, the UK was going into, I don't know, it's third national lockdown. Everyone was very happy. Um, and a few days before uh, in, in government, uh, they were signing petitions about uh, uh, basically not wanting the National Trust, one of our heritage organizations, to have too many difficult stories to you know at stately homes when the national trust was trying to say we really need to talk about slavery it's all around this and they you know they're presenting something so we've got these politicians going we're going into a national lockdown it's a crisis but we'll also sign a petition saying we don't want to besmirch churchill you know we don't we don't we don't want people not to think about downton abbey because you know that's the story they like um so it, i think it's, it's a there's a balancing act there but i think sometimes you just got to push it you know and, and move 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 the dial a bit and i know you, you three in particular i'm really pleased to be on this panel with you because you're doing a tremendous work so um i have a million questions but i'm going to stop so i'm going to go to the audience and maybe i'll phone you all individually after this, <laughs> um uh, well into the evening um but so i'm gonna uh, ask a question from uh anne bagam bagamari i hope i've got your name right um so this is for all the panelists and uh, Anne says, have you ever worked on a revamp of interpretation or presentation to take account of slavery without it feeling bolted on? Can you tell us about that experience? Um, so I can speak um, mm -hmm. from the public history point of view. Um, so the answer is yes. And what we have done is very kind of gently um, rewritten all of the interpretation around our, our particular site where the museum is located and then sites in the town that already existed that the museum had already done. So it would be saying, you know, the Bradley Wheeler House originally built in 1795, um, rebuilt in 1865, and they would talk about the architecture and the material culture of the house. Well, we would, what we did is we took that and then started introducing the facts about slavery at this site and in the town 
you know, very gently within an existing narrative that people have already become accustomed to, almost like we're slipping it in. And the other thing that we've done is we have been, um, and in a way, again, because for us, it's a bit different because it was not interpreted at all, not whatsoever, not at all. So we really kind of are building it from, from scratch. But um, a big part of that is the reinterpretation, like you, you've asked, Anne, um, is social media. So what we will do is do social media posts, particularly around um, physical structures around the town um, or individuals that are town founders. And within the story that people know, incorporate the story of slavery and racial justice or lack thereof. Um, so it becomes kind of gently rewriting and remassaging the story until people start to um, absorb it. Uh, one of the things, I don't know quite what means bolted down, but I know one of the plantations, like I said, I work in the U.S. South and particularly in North South Carolina in that area with rice plantations. And one of the narratives is, is that, you know, Africans went from enslaved to sharecroppers to, you know, you know, other kinds of activities. And one of the things during my interviews, people were like, please tell them that we were never sharecroppers. And that was one of the things that they wanted, because each narrative, that's what you learn, is that each plantation or each community, there are different stories. It's not one story, one size fits all. And that's, it's a very a large complexity in range to these stories. So listening to, again, listening to people and their narratives and bringing those into the conversation and showing that in this particular plantation community or in this particular plantation space that, you know, uh, enslaved Af Africans were in, in able to purchase land. And oftentimes they were working as a day laborer on, on still on some of these plantation sites and getting wages, but they also actually had uh, purchased their own land and had their own uh, places where they were working their own um, uh, homesteads or home areas and things like that. So this narrative of going, you know, in sequence and lockstep is one that has to, and lots of other narratives like that. And I think the more stories and more conversations you have from people from with different perspectives, you open up the range of possibilities for people to tell these stories. And again, not have people locked in to one, you know, one way of thinking about um, people in uh, enslaved uh, people in plantation spaces. And for me, um, I have the chance to to have the opportunity to do it two time in my life. Uh, we built the Memorial Act in in Guadeloupe from nothing, from no collection, no venue, nothing, absolutely nothing no no money no venue and the things aggregate little by little the money first the venue and then the collection to be honest uh, we do it we was a very very little team in guadeloupe working on that and the reason it was a little team it was because nobody was trusting that it will work so because nobody trusts that it will work you can do your stuff make your stuff and uh, it's happened it's right. happened very strongly and uh honestly um Anne, uh, who, who asked the question we do it a little bit like uh caribbean way pirate way a little <laughs> bit. Blah, blah. they don't want it but we can we can we can fit it so it was my, my first experience and the, the second one it's it's right now actually uh as um Laura will say, uh, was saying uh, we're successful from a, a 10 million bid in uh, in UK. So we are going to rebuild. It's not just a transfer of a collection in another building. It's rebuilding uh, another collection with another discourse, with other intellectual content, with uh, try to not bolt slavery in, a, in another story. So it's uh, we are uh, actually in this in this time that you're speaking about, about revamp uh, 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 an entire a complete collection and uh, it's a massive job as you can under, as you can um, understand we we trying to to work uh, the more closer as we can with community we're trying to build um, 
uh, co-curating project, but it's not working with community. Everybody wants to come to work with community. It's in reality, it's not that. It's building a strong relationship, a trust, uh, a common trust relationships. We are we are a very very white organization in Liverpool, so it's not easy to build something to say, okay, let's work with communities and Clark, we, you can tick the box of working with communities. It's not that easy. It's a very, <laughs> very, very long term process. It's 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 maybe maybe this process can can follow on, on several generations of, of communities. So starting now with me, but take several decades before I have a very, very um, deep um, uh, confident relationship and trust between an organization as a traditional museum and the community. So yes, it's a long, long and difficult journey. Yeah, definitely. Um, <laughs> we've, got, we've got a way to go <laughs> in Liverpool, but I'm hoping with, uh, with, you, with you at the helm there and uh, the uh, pirateering, uh, et cetera, um, <laughs> um, I, I might start using that approach in life. So we've got a question from Natalia Zaragoza. Thanks for your answers, guys. Um, what difficulties have you found in um, transferring the oral histories, the interviews, the stories you've learned about food or music or people's daily lives on the plantation into traditional museum settings? So how, what problems have you found? How are you doing that? So, <clears throat> sorry, in our case, um, so, or I think at, at large, um, the difficulty often when you're talking about the lives of the enslaved is that, especially at least here in the North, I would argue to some extent in the Caribbean, um, the material culture is very hard to come by. It's hard to come by those objects that, that are very powerful for telling um, a story, certainly up here. And that is a difficulty that we have to transfer the stories that really talk about um, uh, culture and art, things like music, things like um, storytelling and so on, because we don't have a lot of material culture to go with it. But there's another difficulty that I really wanna say when it comes to um, talking about, um, as Natalia said, food or music or daily life. And it is, and I say this from my own experience, uh, working on the life of Hercules Posey, there is a desire uh, to interpret the life. Uh, so let me say that the people that we know about, that about whom we can talk about this artistry tend to be the most well-known among an unknown group, right? And so there is almost a default desire to treat these people as incredibly remarkable and incredibly different from the enslaved community at large. And this is very difficult to make sure that the interpretation says two things. These are the people that we know about, right? The record is hard to put together. So we have Hercules Posey, we have James Hemings, the chef to, J to, to Thomas Jefferson, and many other people who I'm, I could name that we know about, but, but the plantation culture went on for hundreds of years. So there are hundreds, thousands of people who fit that category who we don't know about, but who were equally skilled, right? So let, we have to be very careful about making these people somehow different and somehow special and somehow therefore worthy of interest because they weren't your run of the mill enslaved person. Because what I always say that to simply survive slavery, to produce generations after you and, and be able to sustain through that is in itself remarkable enough. Whether you produce a piece of music or a petite piece of art or a beautiful dish for the person who enslaved you. So that to me is a, is a difficulty that we that we have to we have to be careful of. Does anyone want to add to that? What's your experience? Well, yeah. well I, I'm, I just said that I totally agree. And I think that telling the story of the everyday is one of the things that um, that the work and research that my students and I do um, with uh, within plantation communities and elsewhere. So making not the monumental the, the story we tell, but the everyday story says, so I totally agree that we there's so many, many more everyday on the ground stories of individuals who you know we made little made little know about 
uh, but that have, you know, a comprehensive understand, give us a comprehensive understanding of the plantation. So I think that's where academia or research comes in. These institutions that have the, you know, the facilities, the legwork, some of the resources available to send people out and have people actually do that re research, that takes a long time, exactly, years to dig in there and find some of these stories, talk to people, become part of communities or engage with communities and gain this trust. So it's not a, 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 a easy thing to do, nor is it, uh, it takes resources. And I think that's the marriage between academia in some ways and museum spaces themselves and uh, a smaller, um, I work with a lot of really small, small startup communities or museums and, and heritage centers, and they need that kind of a relationship uh, and that continuity that can be brought if you forge uh, you know, good relationships and, and not just pull out, tell a story and leave. And you can't do that if you want uh, that level of trust. So I, I agree with everybody says and that you really, you do need to focus on the everyday stories and building relationships is the key to getting some of this information. Thanks a lot. Um, uh, we probably, if, if, if you want to add anything, John, come far, do, we've probably got time for I one more question, but. Yeah, ju just yeah. to say, uh, I absolutely agree with my colleagues. I, I think that um, in order to make the thing, my, 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 uh, my very, very strong concern, it's because I'm speaking for, uh, at least 1,000 people a day in, in, in Liverpool. We are very successful when we are not in time of pandemic. So the, the, the number of people running on in the museum is massive. Mm -hmm. It's, it's uh, 4 million people since we opened. So the responsibility is big to, uh, for the people understanding uh, all this type of story about food, about music. And I think that the best way it's crossing the knowledge, crossing the works, from an academic with the works from a musician or with a, an artist mm -hmm. and because if i if you give me a thesis about food i can I, I cannot do nothing to put it on display in my museum you have to be interpreted by so i think that the we have to open our our world's academic walls to other knowledge and mm -hmm. uh, other type of people in order to create something else that it's immediately understandable by the audience. Mm -hmm. so they can speak Japanese or they can just understand. So that's mm -hmm. for the yeah. first question. Yeah. And the, I, I saw the second one from Brenda, very, very interesting one. I think, I don't know if we need to have on place somewhere to to uh, reflection or decompose. I think that we, we must have one. I think that in, in ISM, for example, we we need to understand that we created discomfort we created discomfort from the the descendant of the enslaved but we're creating also another discomfort with this kind of culpability <laughs> trust it or not culpability coming from people that it's not their ancestor who was owning the enslaved but this, this, there is this kind of white culpability and uh, i think that we cannot say oh no we are just a museum we give you knowledge and take it for you we have to to facing the fact that it's painful and uncomfortable and we have to host this discomfort to say okay we know that something wrong we know that it's not easy we we know that it can be disturbing and we we are happy to host this discomfort somewhere in this museum i don't know i'm not a, a psychologist so i cannot help you directly but I agree that there is a place for you. This, this kind of big thing that you carry on, you can put it somewhere in this museum. There is a place for it. I think that this is a type of things that we have to, to, to think. Yeah. And in a more practical, um, practical um, aspect, I think that we probably for our stuff, we will need the possibility for them to speak with somebody with the job every year for example or every two years of how often they want but i think that they at some point they will need support if they if they need support i think that the organization have to provide support 
Yeah, I would, I would agree with that 100%. And I mean, just really quickly, what we're doing in, in Westport, as I said, we have a brick walk of the names of the enslaved. As we research more people, we install more names. We're about to undertake um, uh, uh, a, a landscape renovation that will include a reflection area, sort of like a meditation area around those bricks for people to be able to sit and think and decompress. But all of our staff is trained um, to be able to speak to the public um, and more than speak to the public, to listen, to listen to people when they bring their discomfort and sometimes hold their tongue, right? And listen carefully <laughs> and show support in return. Um, and, you know, that's what we're, that, and then for the staff itself, we, we provide the same type of support. There are only two of us on this staff that are um, people of color. And so, uh it's a white it's a white staff right so we you know have to to provide training and to provide support for them to support the community that may come and i agree it's necessary um i would like to see a lot more funding from major grant funding organizations to provide that so that we could do our work better does anyone have any last comments i'm, I'm sad that we're going to have to wrap up to do this all evening <laughs> Um, well, look, um, I guess we've gone a little bit uh, past the hour. So what I'm going to say is that I think this is just really the, the, the tip of the iceberg. It's, it's just the beginning, I hope, um, of lots of collaboration and working together and sharing um, different ideas and discussions, not just among ourselves, um, but with you know, a broad audience but everywhere we work, but across, you know, across countries, across continents, um, so that we can expand this and get it right. Um, I mean, there's no right answer, I, I suspect. Um, but so I hope this evening's panel for everyone who's been involved, the panelists, just the start of our collective work. Um, but I hope our audience have enjoyed this. I certainly have. I've learned lots and lots. Um, as I said, I'll pursue all of you individually, but to um, write and um, <laughs> um, uh, And I, I think I, I, I don't doubt our audience um, uh, has learned a lot from me. So I'm going to give you a little sort of side and uh, online <laughs> clap. Um, I'm sure everyone at home is doing the same. So thank you to our panel. And also I want to thank our audience for tuning in um, uh, and listening to this and taking part in the discussion. Um, and uh, I hope that we can move forward with this together um, and can get lots, lots done very quickly. <laughs> <laughs> but I agree the point about funding. It, this is uh, an issue that um, other, other, other entities need to be responsible for too um, and be supporting very seriously. Right, I'm going to say, say good night from Ryan because it's, it's <laughs> getting late now. It's eight o'clock in the evening. <laughs> I think everyone enjoyed their day. And again, thanks again for taking part. <laughs>